Taiwan's next premier pick makes his premier. The hotly anticipated meeting between Taiwan's former president Ma ying and China's Xi Jinping finally takes place. We dive into the historical act defining half a century of U.S.-Taiwan relations. Plus, Taiwan's tourism industry is feeling the aftershock of last week's massive earthquake. Well, welcome to Taiwan Plus News. I'm Ike Vat. Taiwan's president-elect has named former DPP chair Zhou Rongtai as his pick for the country's next premier. Lai Qingde made the announcement in Taipei and Leslie Liao was there. Taiwan president-elect Lai Qingde has announced that Zhou Rongtai will be his pick for premier ahead of his inauguration next month. Now, Zhou Rongtai is a seasoned politician. He's a former Taipei city councillor, a former legislator, and he was once the chair of the ruling Democratic Progressive Party. Taiwan's premier is the top advisor to the president. They're also the head of the central government, and they're tasked with presenting administrative policies to the legislature. Shortly after Zhuo's appointment, Zhuo announced his deputy, his secretary general, and his spokesperson. Taiwan's next vice premier will be former culture minister under President Tsai Ing-wen, Zheng Li-jun. The secretary general will be current head of Taiwan's National Development Council, Gong Mingxin. And the cabinet spokesperson will be Lai Qingde's presidential campaign spokesperson, Chen Sikai. Zhuo's next step will now to be appoint cabinet ministers. He must first recommend names to president like Lai Qingde, whom Lai must confirm. Zhuo has remained non-committal about his picks so far. But one name floating around for foreign minister is current secretary to President Tsai Ing-wen, Lin Jialong. And then there's uh, Wellington Ku, who is the secretary general of the National Security Council right now. His name is in the running for defense minister. Of course, none of this has been confirmed so far. Zhou's appointment as Taiwan's premier may bode well for bridging the gap between the ruling Democratic Progressive Party and the opposition Kuomintang because as news surfaced of Zhuo's appointment, well, the KMT's chair, Eric Zhu, actually praised Zhuo, saying he was a good communicator and a good coordinator. Justin Wu and Leslie Liao in Taipei for Taiwan Plus. To find out more about Zhuo Rongtai's appointment as premier and how it might impact Taiwan's political landscape, Leslie Liao spoke with Courtney Donovan-Smith, a political analyst based in Taichung. Who is Zhuo Rongtai and what are some of his political achievements? I think he's most famous for being the, um, the DPP party chair. It was after the 2018 disastrous loss uh, by the DPP in local elections, Tsai Ing-wen, who was then the party chair, stepped down. And he stepped up and uh, took her place. Now, this was, at, and it was at this point, that uh, Lai Qingde, he decided to challenge Tsai in a primary battle, and it got very, very ugly. What's the significance of his appointment today? He's explicitly very pro-Lai and has been, and apparently they have a good, good relationship. I think it's interesting because he doesn't have a lot of executive experience, and this is, of course, the, the top or second top executive position in the country. It is a little bit of a surprise that he didn't pick someone with more executive experience. What can we come to expect from a Zhuo Rongtai premiership? Well, from his speech today, we don't know. Um, it was basically pretty standard kinds of political speech. There was a lot, lot of throwing around of, uh, of trendy terms like AI and things like that. So uh, at this point, he didn't really give that much of an indication. Eric Zhu, the opposition KMT's chairperson, actually said he praised Zhuo Rongtai, saying that he was a good communicator and a good coordinator. To what end do you think that those sentiments are genuine? I think that he's going to want to sound positive um, on Zhuo. And I think at this point, 
uh, he has an eye on cooperating with the government because they do have a plurality in the legislature and, do, and can't necessarily rely on the TPP all the time. So being able to work with the DPP administration may mean that more can be accomplished. As far as future cabinet minister appointments go, who might we expect for any of the positions? I think it's too early to speculate, but definitely watch out to see if he picks Lin Jialong and Song Wen San. Both of them are heavyweights in the party. But I do think that Lai probably would benefit from giving more important positions uh, to uh, members of other factions. And uh, I think, this, uh, second of all, uh, probably more women. That was political analyst Courtney Donovan Smith speaking to Leslie Liao. Taiwan's former president, Ma ying has finally met with Chinese President Xi Jinping during a visit to China. This is a historic second meeting between the two. Tiffany Wong has updates from Taipei. Tiffany, what have we heard from this meeting? That's right. Now, Ma and she have just met. And in opening comments ahead of a closed door meeting, she emphasized a shared culture and history um, between China and Taiwan. Um, and he also warned against uh, foreign interference in cross strait affairs. Now, of course, uh, China claims Taiwan as its own, uh, which in his eyes makes that an internal matter. Now, Ma continued his calls for peace in the Taiwan uh, Strait, some, uh, something he's been promoting throughout his trip in China. Uh, he's been leading a group of Taiwanese youth on cultural exchange there. And she said that he supported uh, this kind of uh, youth exchange across the strait. Um, Ma also restated his commitment to the 1992 consensus, which is the idea that there is one China, but both sides have their own interpretations of who is in charge. Do their discussions hold any significance for cross-strait relations? Now, the points that Ma and she brought up are not entirely new. And ahead of the meeting, China watchers basically told me they expected to hear these exact same kind of comments. Um, so it doesn't seem to indicate any change in cross-strait policy for the two. Um, now, of course, um, Ma has been making attempts to downplay cross-strait tensions throughout his trip. And this comes at a pivotal moment ahead of uh, Taiwan inaugurating its next president. That's Lai Xingde, and he's somebody that Beijing sees as less than friendly. Now, one analyst I spoke with said that this meeting that just happened is actually similar to the first meeting between Ma and Xi that happened in 2015, nearly 10 years ago. Now, that was back when Ma was president of Taiwan um, and was largely seen as symbolic. And now that Ma holds no office in Taiwan, uh, this meeting may hold even less significance for cross-strait relations. Thank you, Tiffany. That was our reporter, Tiffany Wong, with updates on the Marshy meeting. It's been 45 years since a landmark piece of U.S. legislation set the foundations for Washington's ties with Taipei. Jeremy Olivier looks at how the Taiwan Relations Act has come to define the close but unofficial relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan in the decades since. The end of an era and of a nearly four-decade post-war order in Asia on December 15, 1978, then-U.S. President Jimmy Carter announced that his country would break diplomatic ties with Taiwan, switching recognition to the People's Republic of China. The move was a long time coming. Taiwan had been expelled from the United Nations several years earlier, in 1971, with few recognizing its claim to be the legitimate government of all of China. And under Carter's predecessor, Richard Nixon, the U.S. began normalizing relations with Beijing. Still, the mood in Taipei was grim. People, angry with what they saw as a betrayal by the U.S., held increasingly violent anti-American protests. The government, under the lead of President Jiang Jingguo, tried to quell public outrage and chart a new course forward. Former diplomat Frederick Qin, Taiwan's deputy foreign minister at the time, was one of the top officials in charge of overseeing the American transition out of Taiwan. His task was to negotiate certain assurances. Most importantly, security. Second, arms sale. Third, the property we have in the United States. And then uh, we have air links 
and uh, shipping. Will there be possible to continue or that PRC might take over? But Taiwan still had strong support from many on Capitol Hill. A group of Congress members, upset with Carter's switch to the PRC, worked to craft a piece of legislation that would come to define the U.S.-Taiwan relationship in the decades since. While behind the scenes, people on the ground in Taiwan were also hard at work making sure that the law would be strong enough to last. One of them was Robert Parker, who had just become chair of the American Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan. Parker traveled from Taipei to Washington, D.C. to campaign for protecting not just U.S. business interests in Taiwan, but also the robust trade and investment ties the two countries had developed. The challenge was to fill that void, to describe in practical terms what we as Americans, <clears throat> both in the business community in Taiwan and in a broader sense between our two countries, needed on a practical basis to continue cordial, successful, normal relations in the absence of formal diplomatic relations. Parker and others' testimony proved persuasive, and the bill that was signed into law on April 10, 1979, was much more powerful than President Carter or Beijing had anticipated. The Taiwan Relations Act calls for Taiwan to be treated the same as any other foreign country under U.S. laws allows the U.S. to provide weapons for Taiwan's defense, directs the president to inform Congress of any threats to Taiwan's security, and establishes the American Institute in Taiwan, a nonprofit corporation that serves as Washington's de facto embassy in Taipei. In the years since the TRA was passed, U.S.-Taiwan relations have significantly deepened, yet the threat from China, which claims Taiwan as its own, has continued to grow. It's caused some to rethink the act's limitations and to call for a clearer stance from the U.S. We argue that the U.S. should maybe uh, adopt a strategy called dual clar clarity. That is to specify uh, under what conditions that the U.S. will uh, do uh, the intervention and the, 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 the military help to Taiwan. For example, if China use force, then the U.S. will help Taiwan. And the U.S. should be very clear that if Taiwan changes status quo, then the U.S. will not uh, help Taiwan. Despite growing concerns over Taiwan's security, the TRA has endured as the strong foundation of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship, one which has allowed ties to flourish for more than four decades. Chris Ma and Jeremy Olivier for Taiwan Plus. As you just heard, former AmCham chair Robert Parker helped pave the way for the chamber to fill in certain gaps in the U.S.-Taiwan relationship after Washington broke official ties with Taiwan. In an exclusive interview with Taiwan Plus, current AmCham chair Dan Silver spoke with our reporter Joyce Tsung on the chamber's vision for the future of U.S.-Taiwan relations. To what extent has the Taiwan Relations Act guided um, MTEM's work as a business community? I think it plays a very serious and significant role. Uh, it is a framework, and it's a framework that exists in a space that without the TRA might have nothing. When derecognition occurred, there was not a go-to model for how the U.S.-Taiwan relationship would be structured. U.S. businesses, unlike the U.S. government, had continuity here in mm -hmm. Taiwan. So the chamber took on this role of kind of an intermediary. Mm -hmm. uh, we were very fortunate at that time that we had a chairperson, Robert Parker, who was a lawyer. And Robert Parker, being a lawyer, was able to think about the legal issues from a United States and American perspective right. and help address those with Congress in February of the next year. And the membership for which I speak consists of the people who live and work in Taiwan who actually carry on the ongoing commercial relationship between the United States and the Republic of China. We went from a typical chamber of commerce representing business and maybe the interests of the community and social interests to one that became very much involved with advocacy and helping make sure that there is stability and there's a structure in the way that the U.S. and Taiwan interact mm. is something that AmCham has been a part of ever since. Mm. And um, Mr. Silver, you've often mentioned um, a more urgent need for a bilateral trade agreement between Taiwan and the U.S. I'm 
curious what the reception in Washington has been like. Can you describe this a little bit? And also, you know, are you expecting that to change given it's an election year? So the bilateral trade agreement is something that is at the top of our members' hopes for future engagement between the United States and Taiwan. We're conducting physical door knocks in Washington, D.C. again, and that will also happen in June. This, too, is an annual event. We bring leaders of industry from Taiwan to Washington to have direct dialogue on Capitol Hill and with other decision makers. Mm -hmm. The good news is that even if a bilateral trade agreement is still something that is a discussion point, and I think has bipartisan support. There are other things that are definitely happening this year. 21st Century Initiative on Trade is one of those things. The USTR, USTR in its March report to President Biden said that it was really at the top of their agenda for this year and trying to get the second half of that done. What would you say is central to that advocacy um, that you're describing and how has it evolved throughout the years? So uh, evolved greatly. And if we think simply about the shared values that we have with Taiwan today, mm. shared democratic values, probably couldn't have said that to the same extent in 1979 or even in the 1980s. Today we can. We've continued to build on this and work in terms of economic engagement, in terms of trade, in terms of helping the U.S. government and others in Washington see Taiwan as a very important part of the U.S. economic structure around the world. That was Joyce Zung speaking with Dan Silver, chair of the American Chamber of Commerce in Taiwan. Continued Israeli attacks on the Gaza Strip loom over Palestinians on Eid al-Fitr, a three-day festival marking the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. Rosie Greninger reports. Makeshift markets inside Gaza's Jabalia refugee camp sell goods for Eid al-Fitr a holy day on the Muslim calendar where a feast marks the end of the fasting month of Ramadan. But for Palestinians here in the war-torn enclave who have lived through six grueling months of Israeli bombardment, there's little to celebrate this holiday season. more than 33,000 people have been killed in the conflict and more than 75,000 injured. The Gaza Strip is facing a humanitarian crisis. Most of its 2.3 million people are displaced, their homes flattened by Israeli airstrikes, grieving the loss of loved ones and unable to access essential aid. A very different reality this year, in a time usually filled with festive foods, tradition and time with family. But there are those attempting to soften the horrors of war and keep the spirit of Eid alive. A group of seven women in this Rafah camp are baking traditional biscuits to bring some joy to the children of Gaza and using the small income to help them survive. <laughs> While outside the strip, children in Jordan have volunteered to pack boxes of aid to help celebrate the holiday season. Filled with food, messages of support, and clothes Muslims usually purchase to mark the annual occasion. Under growing international pressure, Israel said they allowed over 300 trucks of aid into Gaza, the highest daily volume since the war began. This comes after an Israeli airstrike killed seven aid workers delivering food. 
but the United Nations says much more is required to feed the millions of people on the brink of starvation. And the humanitarian situation in Gaza is expected to get worse. Ceasefire talks have stalled, and Israel has announced it's set a date for a ground invasion of Rafah, the last refuge for displaced Palestinians. But for this one holy event, Palestinians in Gaza are determined to make the most of what little they have to celebrate Eid, despite the cloud of conflict and loss bearing down on them. Dolphine Chen and Rosie Greninger for Taiwan Plus. Hualien's tourism industry could lose more than 160 million US dollars due to last week's massive earthquake. And that figure is just for the month of April. As John Van Trias reports, staff at some hotels who've already lost their homes may soon lose their jobs too. From the outside, earthquake damage to the Chateau de Chine Hotel in Hualien is hard to spot. But the findings from building inspectors are clear. Last week's 7.2 earthquake has damaged this building beyond repair. After decades of operation, it'll have to come down. The owners plan to rebuild, but in the meantime, all 86 of its staff are out of work. It's more bad news for this scenic part of Taiwan, where tourism drives the economy. Some people already lost their homes in the quake, and the prospect of losing their jobs as well has left them with an uncertain future. The owners have other hotels and businesses elsewhere in Taiwan and will transfer staff willing to make the move, but that could mean moving to a different part of the country. The rest will get severance pay in line with Taiwanese law, something officials have promised to enforce. But these employees, at least, have a chance at a replacement job. The staff at the destroyed Taroko Village Hotel may have to figure things out for themselves. Not all of Hualien's tourism infrastructure was damaged, but even the survivors are in for hard times. Taroko National Park, one of the country's big attractions, is closed indefinitely, and disruptions from the earthquake have led to many cancellations. As hotel bookings plunge, the local tourism industry predicts losses of 166 million U.S. dollars in April alone. Although the shaking has dropped off, the shock from this earthquake continues. Eason Chen and John Van Trieste for Taiwan Plus. The earthquake in Hualien has reshaped Taiwan's topography. Taiwan's National Mapping Center has compared elevations across the country before and after the earthquake. It found land around the epicenter is now an average of 8.1 centimeters higher than it had been. In one area, land even rose 45 centimeters. Search and rescue efforts are still underway after Taiwan's massive earthquake last week. Our reporter Reese Ayres meets the four-legged heroes taking part in the operation. Picking through debris left by a devastating earthquake, search and rescue dog Roger is an integral member of the teams, risking their lives to find survivors or bring closure to the families of the victims. It was Roger's powerful nose that helped locate one of the victims killed by a landslide following the 7.2 magnitude quake that struck Hualien on April 3rd. The quake was the biggest to hit Taiwan in a quarter of a century and claimed at least 15 lives. 
Roger is obedient and has spent years honing his keen sense of smell. Now a veteran in his field, eight-year-old Roger is close to the end of his career. Service dogs in Taiwan must retire by the age of nine. But Roger wasn't always meant to land a job in search and rescue. Initially trained as a drug-sniffing dog, he was sacked from that role for being too playful, a reputation he lives up to to this day. <laughs> and Roger isn't the only dog helping with search and rescue efforts. His colleague Wilson, a Jack Russell Terrier, also helped locate several victims. And with the next generation of service dogs already in training, Roger can soon begin his well-earned retirement, having loyally served his country during one of the worst disasters on record. Okay. Karma Shu and Reese's for Taiwan Plus. Thank you for watching Taiwan Plus News. You can visit the Taiwan Plus website or follow our social media for more stories for, from Taiwan and around the world. Finally, take a look at crowds of devotees in Mumbai celebrating Gaudi Padwa, a festival that marks the beginning of the new year for some Hindu groups. I'm Ikevat. Take care and see you next time. For more stories from here in Taiwan and around the world, be sure to check out our social media or visit us at TaiwanPlus.com.